This is a five gallon bucket. It's pretty heavy. And what I do is I kick my legs out from under me, putting myself in like a plank position. And then I rotate the bucket towards me. It is a rainy Monday morning and I'm currently listening to my 52nd book of the year. Not as many as I would have listened to in the past because I don't run much uh, and listen anymore while out in the woods. Uh, that used to be something that would allow me to get through a book every two days or three days. Anyway, what I'm currently listening to is What Life Should Mean to You by Alfred Adler, which is an older book on psychoanalytic theory and how meaning develops in people and how meaning can go awry and lead to aberrant behavior or the development of a psyche or identity that is problematic to both the individual and the groups that they find themselves nested within. Anyway, this is possibly going to be a high volume week. We'll see if I can get up to 24, 25 hours for this week. Uh, I never know. I'm not going to force myself, but I'm going to give myself plenty of opportunities to move and I'm going to clear my plate a little bit to allow for that extra movement. Uh, and we'll see. Finland is in early February, so one, two, three, four months away. So I've got a I'm not going to say put the hammer down because I don't want to put pressure on myself, but I've got to see if I can grease the path towards higher volume and some more high intense sessions. Like the weight vest with the pull-ups and the dips is creating some more intensity and I'm seeing the results pretty quickly. Uh, we'll see if I can do the same and roller skiing or perhaps mountain running now that the ankle is behaving. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna go upstairs and do some writing and check in with my clients. It is a brightish Tuesday morning and I am listening to Alfred Adler's What Life Should Mean to You. And there's some good stuff in here, but it's also really old school and somewhat superstitious. What I mean by that is that he talks about different shapes of heads and noses and body parts and how that relates to introversion and extroversion and schizoid personalities. And, and we've moved way beyond that at this point in time. But there's also some good stuff in this book. He wasn't all wrong. But uh, this particular chapter is a bit odd. All right, time to go upstairs and do some editing and then some digging. Got to go back and try to make some big progress on the trench under the house for winter hits. Time to go to work in the hole. This dirt here is about 60% of what I've pulled out from under the house. A lot of it I've carted over to the field to fill in old plow furrows. All right, so this is the tunnel that I have hand dug under the house. And this is where I'm currently working. And you can see there how the cinder block has collapsed. There was a cinder block here that collapsed and this wasn't even touching. So this beam is bowed if I were to back up. That cinder block there has collapsed. And over on the edge, there's very little supports. Um, a lot of the beams were just hanging in midair, nothing supporting them. So I got a lot of work to do in here, a lot of digging. And I'm using a little trowel, which I take and 
chip away at the clay and then I bring a bucket in. I fill the bucket up with my hands and drag it out. And this is how I've been working. And sometimes I use this tool here if there are bigger rocks. I found all this pottery buried in the dirt, which means that this dirt was put here. This is an old dump. So it's not that they built the house on top of the ground. They dug a hole, filled it with garbage, and then built the house on top of that. Really neat patterns. Just the bottom of a bowl. wonder how old all this is. Anyway, people used to just throw things in a dump pile right behind their house back in the day. My favorite part is pushing myself out backwards because the hole is deeper at the end, so I have to push myself backwards uphill. And it's a phenomenal core workout. Oh, I love that. All right. Then I take a bucket, which rained last night, get the water out. And I log half an hour of this as training. I'm working a lot more than half an hour and it's, it's pretty hard work. My core and shoulders get smoked. But I'm only logging half an hour. So I'm literally digging a cellar by hand. This is a five gallon bucket. It's pretty heavy. And what I do is I kick my legs out from under me putting myself in like a plank position. And then I rotate the bucket towards me. And this is a phenomenal core workout. Rawr! I kick my legs out and then rotate it. Oh. One bucket at a time. Rawr. And then the last part is a really steep uphill. So, this is my process. Could have hired someone to do this. Spend 20 or 30 grand digging a cellar under the house, jacking it up with heavy equipment, but that would cost 20 or 30 grand and I would miss out on this phenomenal opportunity to get really, really strong through manual labor. So no complaints here. And just doing this is a great core workout too. Reaching out and pulling the dirt towards you is a great ski activity. Working my lats, working my shoulders, working my core. I'm on the summit of Mount Anthony in Bennington. Just ran up. Longest run I will have done in quite some time. I'm feeling good. It's a four mile climb to get here. And uh yeah, skiing is just changing how my legs move, my upper body, my core, I'm just more stable, my shoulders are back. Everything is just feeling better all the way around because of ski training. It's nice to be out in the woods, a lot of beech leaves still on the trees, maples are mostly done. And uh, I've been playing over something that happened earlier today while I was roller skiing. I was going up Bank Street in Bennington, which is about a 5% climb. And I was working on my new locked core position. I was moving along at a pretty good pace, but I wasn't going hard. And there was a woman walking down the street and she smiled at me as I approached and then shook her head 
and said, slow the F down, dude. And then just shook her head smiling as she walked by. And that's been playing on my mind because she doesn't know me. She doesn't know what I'm doing, what I'm in the midst of. She doesn't know what my capabilities are. Maybe she's never seen anybody ski like that, but I was not going hard. And who is she to tell me what speed I should ski at? Now, am I personally offended? No. But this is just another example of people being in their own story, in their own world of what is proper, and then projecting that out onto other people uh, and trying to control other people's behavior. And this is something I've experienced throughout my life. There have been a lot of very dominant, controlling people in my life, which is one of the reasons that I started studying psychology, because it's hard to survive around dominant people if you're shy, introverted, quiet, and insecure. You end up just eating your feelings all the time, and that can lead to self-loathing and depression and all kinds of other fun stuff. Anyway, so this is something that I spend a great deal of time thinking about and finding examples all around of people not minding their own business, and also the belief that what they think is proper is universally proper. And this has got me thinking about the present moment, which you hear in spiritual circles, and you'll even hear me talk about, but I've been spending a decade now trying to define what that might be describing. Well, in this instance, her present was a guy skiing up a hill too hard, too fast, to the point where she felt she needed to comment. And that was present to her. That's what she experienced. But what she wasn't present to is the larger context. So this is where this idea of a present moment becomes complicated because we as human individuals in a complex modern world don't exist or function or behave in present moments that are unlinked to other moments inside of grand narrative contexts. In other words, goals. So I have a goal to go to the World Championships in Finland in February, and I'm training for that goal. And what I was doing today was not just appropriate, but necessary. But she can't see my goal. She can't see the larger context. She can only see a body doing something that her body, when empathetically mapping it, says, mm, that doesn't feel good, that doesn't look good, I don't like that. Um, at least that's how I'm interpreting it. Uh, otherwise, why would she have said that? So we have to be so careful that what we call the present isn't a projection of our own abilities, our own feelings, and our own beliefs onto something that looks like an external object. That body moving towards me is just an external object. It doesn't have its own context. It doesn't have a larger world that it's moving in. I do, the judger, the person looking at him skiing. I have a larger context, but he doesn't. He's a simple uh, object in my present moment. And this is where, again, I spend so much time thinking, writing, and breaking apart this idea of the present, because in a human context, it doesn't make all that much sense. Everybody is going to have a different present moment with differing degrees of larger context and smaller experiential sensory input. And it's really about finding a balance. It's about not just living in the sensory input and it's also about not just living in the grand narrative context and never experiencing things or objects in the world around you. But when you do experience these objects, rather than judging them and projecting your context onto them, be curious. She wasn't curious about me. She passed a judgment about me. She might have asked, what are you training for? It looks like you're moving pretty hard up this hill. What's your goal? Uh, but instead of curiosity, there was just a judgment. Anyway, those are my thoughts as I walk down through the leaf-covered rocks. 30% uh, slope. See ya.
I've decided to start my day with a run. So I'm gonna head up to Woodford, do some filming of the foliage, not sure which trail I'll go to yet. And that gives me some more time to listen to what life should mean to you. I get an extra half hour of listening today. I wanna get that book done. I don't like it. Uh, it's really gone off a cliff. I'll listen, I'll take notes, I'll be open. But at the same time, he's using psychoanalysis, which means that we don't have neuroscience, we don't know how the brain works, so we're just going to think about possibilities. This is what dreams are. This is why identities do what they do. We don't have the benefit of hard science yet. So at this point, when the book was written, Psychology was a soft science. It was just theorizing. Uh, and a lot of the theories were way off the mark. So um, it's good to understand where a lot of psychoanalysis comes from because it does still infiltrate present therapy and a lot of psychological interventions. There are many different schools of therapy uh, and some of them still rely on ancient psychoanalysis. Anyway. I'm gonna finish that book, but more importantly, I'm gonna get out and go for a run. Today felt like a pull-up day. So I started out with two sets of five neutral pull-ups, super easy. So I popped the weight vest on, did another set of five, and thought, hmm, let's up the ante a little bit. So I immediately took the weight vest off and did five more without it. Waited a few minutes, put the weight vest back on, cranked out four or five, took it off, immediately did five without it. And I've done six, I think six sets of those so far. And they're hard. My heart rate's getting up there. And I started getting scared. I didn't want to do another set because pull-ups with a weight vest and then five without the weight vest had already maxed itself out for my identity. So I got creative. Instead of doing another set of that, I added 38 pounds to a weight belt Ugh, right here. So now I've got 58 pounds on me, 20 and 38. And I'm not scared of that. It's fascinating. I'm doing much harder pull-ups now, but I'm not scared because I don't have a history with it. So this is how you can trick yourself. The moment you feel that something has become too much, shake it up a little bit, change it somehow. You can even make it harder as long as you make it harder in a different way. So here I go, neutral pull-ups with 58 extra pounds. And I'm using a Dollar Tree silicon uh, pot holder, I guess you'd call it, that I cut in half and I'm gonna put that over the wooden bars because I tend to blister when there's a lot of weight on there. All right, so here we go, 58 pounds. <sighs> I think two is good, but I'm going to come down real slow. I didn't want to do more. I don't want to kill myself. I've already done a lot, but come down real slow. All right, so a set of two at 58 pounds with a slow descent. I'm going to call that done. I'm finding myself having a bit of a challenge related to ski training of late. So I thought I'd take a moment to unpack that and tell you how I'm working around it. Fall is arguably the most important time of year for training as a cross-country skier. This is when you really ramp up your roller ski volume. And even though I've been pretty good about getting myself out there all summer, as the temperatures start to drop, I feel more and more resistance to get out on roller skis. And there's a couple reasons for that. Number one, it's more difficult to dress for because you've got a lot of wind coming at you. Uh, so you get sweaty on a climb. Then on the downhill, you've got that uh, breeze which cools you off. Cyclists deal with the same thing. Your hands get cold because you're gripping the poles tight. But more importantly, it's what happens to the pavement on a cold day. It gets really hard and it makes it more difficult for the pole tips to stick in and give you a good grip. So what often happens is that 
you try to get the grip and one of your poles slips or maybe both of your poles slips, which can cause you to fall, cause you to be off balance, and it makes a horrific noise. So when this is happening, say every fifth to sixth polling, it's a constant shock to your system, both physically related to balance and orally. But I'm also really self-conscious when it comes to the amount of noise I make. I don't want the people in town, because I generally ski in town, I don't want them to hear my pole slips because they're super loud. Uh, and it like screeches across the pavement as it slides back. Last summer, I was skiing on a rural road and I had a pole slip and it was super loud and it echoed across the valley that I was in. And like a minute later, a guy pulls up next to me in a Jeep and says, hey, did you hear that gunshot? I said, no, what are you talking about? He said, there was a loud gunshot right in front of my house. I said, no, I didn't hear any guns, but I slipped my pole and that created a lot of noise. He said, no, this was way too loud, it scared the crap out of me. And I said, I think it was my pole slipping. He's like, no, it was a gunshot. And anyway, he went on his way, but it's really loud and it's a strong sound. So I don't want to be going through a residential neighborhood making that sound every 30 to 40 seconds. So I've built up this resistance to roller skiing when the pavement gets cold. Even though you sharpen your pole tips with a diamond file, they still slip. So what am I doing considering that I'm not getting out there on skis as often? I'm doing bigger sessions on the elliptical and I'm doing bigger sessions on the polling machine over there. So I'm getting my arm, back, and core strength from the polling machine and I'm building leg strength on the elliptical. And I don't do the elliptical like I used to. I'm bending my knees more and I'm kind of pushing side to side so I push my body across. Uh, and I'm really leaning forward on the instrument panel so I can get some glute activation. Uh, and that is my substitute. Now, it's not perfect. Roller skiing would obviously be better. But this training process for me now, or should I say this training experiment, isn't about doing what's perfect. It's not about forcing myself to do what a coach would prescribe me to do to get the best result. It's about how I can consistently engage throughout the day, every day, so that when the time comes where I can approach the more difficult activities, I'm ready to go and I've got this gigantic base that I can build on. And this is how I approach all my training now. It's about remaining consistent and avoiding disappointment. So I'm not getting out roller skiing. Am I disappointed? No, because I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing other things. And that's okay, that's the goal. The goal is consistent engagement. The goal is not roller skiing. If roller skiing happens, that's great, that's a bonus. But consistent movement is what I'm up to here. And I'm trying to make the elliptical fun. Uh, I watch races, I watch movies, and I'm about to watch The Transporter 2 with Jason Statham, which is bringing up all kinds of memories. He used to come into the restaurant that I worked at quite a bit when he was becoming a star. He wasn't quite there yet. Uh, and he would sit at this one table uh, in the back on the banquette and he would order miso soup. That was like his main thing. And he said it with that gravelly accent. A bowl of miso, please. So I'm going to hop into some Jason Statham and watch his ridiculous action stunts and uh, then hop on the polling machine. And, and that's enough. That's good. So here we go. It's a very rainy morning here in the educational bubble. Today I'm listening to Robert Sapolsky's new book, Determined, where he argues that there is no such thing as free will and therefore we should do away with moral responsibility. It is unjust to punish people for their actions because they're not choosing them. So we need to change our thinking and our legal system uh, because people aren't in control of what they do. But there's a contradiction there. People that are being judged for having done something morally reprehensible, therefore criminal, if they couldn't control what they're doing, then how is it that we, listening to this book, can change our thinking, can change our legal system so as not to judge people because they can't change, but we can change? So is it that some people have free will and others don't? 
Like, is this an oppressor oppressed thing? Uh, critical theory that he's trying to bring in? I don't know yet. He hasn't defined free will, and I think that's problematic. You should define it right away. Um, I like Robert Sapolsky. I've learned so much from him, but I don't know. I, he's skating on thin ice. We'll see where he goes. It is a wet and windy Sunday morning, and I'm just stopping in to get the paper and lottery ticket for my family. It's Sunday brunch day. My niece is home for the weekend, so she's coming over. She's at college now. And uh, I've been listening to Robert Sapolsky's new book, Determined. Um, basically, why there is no such thing as free will. And I agree with him on most things, but he, like just about everyone else, is kind of missing the point. When people describe free will, they're talking about the conscious agent, your identity. But what they're not talking about is you as a being outside of consciousness. Like consciousness is a tool that you use. Your identity is a tool that you use. Now, when I say you, not the conscious you that's listening to this, the rest of you, all of you, you as a being, as a greater entity. Uh, consciousness and identity are just tools that we employ. And they're not all that they're cracked up to be. When I started learning about this research, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, what he's mentioning now in the book, it was kind of shattering to my sense of existence. I had an existential crisis of sorts when you realize that your consciousness and your identity are fabrications. Uh, but that's what the science shows. And once you come to terms with that and you accept it and you allow that to be true, life gets a lot easier. You stop fighting, you stop suffering because the fighting and the suffering occur within a virtual identity narrative, otherwise known as thinking. And thinking equals sinking. So yeah, you as a conscious identity is mostly a parlor trick and free will is not a thing, but you as a greater being is making choices all the time, which then get fed into consciousness, where this I thinks that it made the choice even though it didn't, even though the choice was made by you as a greater being long before consciousness got the message. It just bubbled up into consciousness and they're like, oh yeah, I want to do this. No, you're just consciously aware of what you as a being has chosen. Uh, and now you're taking credit for it. Anyway, um, yeah. I really like Robert Sapolsky's work, but he's another one of those people that's done some phenomenal research and has an incredible understanding of the research in his field and many others, but he's also a human that doesn't understand his own psychology, and he admits as much in any interview you've ever seen done with him. He's uh, not in any way using this information to improve, enhance, or evolve his own personal psychology. So that's why I believe he's missing the point, because uh, he just hasn't done that kind of work. I hopped on the elliptical to try to get 45 minutes before I head off to brunch, but I'm feeling really light and weak. So rather than pushing through that, I'm doing 10 minute sets. I get on, I start with gentle movement, allow myself to work into it. And at 10 minutes, I get off and I do some work on the computer. So I'm not gonna get 45 minutes because my time window is running short, but I'll get 30 and 10 minute sets will be how I get there. And I'm suspecting that the final set, I've already done two and I'm feeling pretty weak. I may break it into two five minute sets and we'll see. Uh, maybe I only get 25 minutes. There's no goal. I'm just setting a possibility and then seeing what happens. So gentleness, always gentleness. My gentle goal this week was to keep the pull-ups and dips going with some weight and to do some more polling machine. I wanted to try to get at least 30 minutes a day in on the polar. I didn't accomplish that every day, but 
pretty good most days. The goal eventually is to see if I can do 45 minutes to an hour a day on the polling machine. Uh, that would really help as uh, I get towards skiing and snow uh, because roller skiing right now, the cold makes it not a lot of fun. So I can come in here and work a lot of the same muscles on the polar and the elliptical. So let me show you what I did this week. Decided to get out the ab crunch on Monday, a couple sets of that. Some dips with 38 pounds after three sets of warm up. Feels pretty good. Deep push ups, I really like those. Knees to bar, some pulling at a pretty good weight. That was a good session. And just some pulling on Wednesday, neutral pull ups, warm up, and then 38 pounds, immediately followed by a set of five without weight. Uh, did that a few times and then a set of two at 58 pounds. That's a new record for me. That felt good. Thursday knees to bar, a couple sets of dips. Mm, good intense pulling session. Friday ball squats uh, with a 30 pound slam ball, some dips, pretty easy. Pulling, uh, somewhat annoying, good set. Saturday, I tried a set of regular pull-ups, but my shoulder and bicep really don't like that. So I switched over to neutral and that felt a lot better. And then a pretty good polling session. And then today, just some deep push-ups. So as I head into a new week, I'm going to try to keep my hours up there. I don't know if that'll happen, but we'll see. I'll just point myself in that direction as often as I can. And I will see you in the next one.